very much for joining us in this afternoon. Um, this is the second webinar under the Confederation of Indian Industries new initiative. And this initiative is on promoting and adopting responsible business practices in the Indian corporate sector. This is the second webinar that we've attempted in this subject and uh, in this session we're going to be discussing how we can protect employees in fraud reporting and how we can strengthen the whistleblower mechanism. So my name is Smriti Chandrasekhar. I'm going to be taking you uh, through this session and it will be great if you know, we can have a discussion on what kind of challenges whistleblowers face and we'll also look at some best practices or examples of how we can strengthen the whistleblower mechanism. Okay, so the agenda broadly is this. Um, I'll take you through a brief introduction. We'll discuss the role of the whistleblower in fraud detection. Why is it so important that we pay attention to this aspect? Um, what are the challenges usually faced by employees? Why do people hesitate to raise a red flag or to call out to a particular practice and communicate to someone? We'll also look at what practices we can adopt to encourage reporting and we'll also look at some things that we can start immediately, very basic and simple steps that we can start to strengthen the entire whistleblower mechanism. Uh, if you have any comments or any questions, you can use the chat box available on the screen and we'll address them towards the end in the Q&A session. So we all hear this term whistleblower. Now who or what is a whistleblower? Uh, usually it's any person who observes any unethical or improper practice. Now from a pure company perspective, this could be a violation of a company policy, this could be an unethical practice. Some of these need not even be a violation of law. So any person who is aware or observes any of these unethical or improper practices, that person could be termed a whistleblower. And as the name, sub name suggests, it is someone who blows the whistle or who calls out on a transactions which may not seem black or white. Now, once we know what a whistleblower is, usually the next question is, what is an unethical or an improper practice? This is a question that many of us uh, struggle to answer. Now, when it comes to fraud and corruption, not everything is black or white. There are many gray areas. So, when I say unethical or improper practice, uh, what are we talking about? Are we talking about fraud or corruption, extortion? Are these different terms? A lot of people think fraud and corruption are the same, when in reality they mean different things. In India, we also have a practice of giving gifts during different festivals and occasions. Entertainment expenses also form part of the entire gamut of marketing. So how many of these or which of these transactions are okay? Which of these are not? These are some questions which are very difficult to answer with a straightforward yes or no. Another very common example is if the vendor is related. So let's say I introduce a supplier into the company, does that automatically make the transaction unethical? So if someone says there is a conflict of interest, how does one then determine whether a particular transaction is unethical or not? So these are questions or challenges that we face very often and it is very difficult to get a clear-cut answer on these. Now as we speak of the whistleblower, why is it important to a company or why is it important to the management to focus on protecting the whistleblower and ensuring that the mechanism is strong? Well, one of the largest things is that, one of the most compelling reasons is that the whistleblower is a person who can raise a red flag which can trigger off an investigation into a much larger scheme of things. 
There's this very interesting quote by Edmund Burke, which says, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. So employees who are silent observers within the company and have access to a lot of information, they are the ones who can flag off or trigger any red flag on a transaction. So why is it important to create this environment? The main thing is to ensure, in order to create an environment of integrity, generally employees must be encouraged to report violations. Um, if you have looked at any surveys in the public domain, most of them would suggest that majority of frauds are detected through complaints received. And these complaints come from employees. However, at the same time, there are also many surveys that indicate that a lot of employees do not raise the red flag on doubtful practices. So the reason for this could be many, and we look at that as we move on. So from this, we can, I think we can infer that employees are the single largest and the best source to investigate complaints. While we may have many preventive and detective mechanisms in place, um, statistically and through surveys, it's been clearly shown that employees are the single largest and best source to start off an investigation on complaints. So while this is important, what kind of practices or what kind of transactions can employees be aware of that could trigger an investigation of, of a much larger scale? Now employees are literally the eyes and ears of the organization. Okay, so we have a few examples of practices that employees could be aware of. Now, as senior management or as a company, if one comes to know of these transactions, then different remediation measures could be put in place. So one example is vendor corruption. So let's say there's a junior employee in a purchasing department. There is a very high chance that he might be aware of any suspicious agreements or uh, relationships with a vendor. So let's say the purchasing manager, for example, is on a call with the vendor, the junior employee could be in the same room, and he might be privy to a conversation which could suggest corruption. Or maybe in many cases, um, the, uh, the, this employee has multiple purchase requisitions, and when it comes to raise the purchase order, the manager is asking him to wait for some time. So all these call, create a little doubt in the mind of the junior employee and that you know, tends to trigger off the question, is this an unethical practice or not? Now, when a proper mechanism is in place for this employee to raise this doubt or question, then the senior management can then be aware that something is wrong and this is an area that we need to focus on. Conflict of interest. Now, this is again another case which is very difficult to detect through normal audit or you know any fraud detection or prevention measures. Very often, close friends or family situations, um, you know, you'll have a relationship from a from a vendor perspective or even internally within the company. There was this one case where uh, the company was. There was this one particular case where the purchasing manager's wife is working in the assets team. So uh, the administration team or the person who's in charge of assets was married to the purchase manager and every time the transactions were being routed through a particular vendor and the request would come from the wife's department. Now while an audit might not typically detect some of these, an employee from an outside perspective or some other employee from the purchase team is able to raise the flag and say, I don't think this is a practice, this is not a good practice because there is a clear conflict of interest there because the request is coming from the user and finally uh, it is going back to the same person and they are in a, a conflicting situation. Financial statement fraud is also another instance where employees might be aware of any suspicious or false entries. Um, for instance, there was this one case where a junior employee was privy to a conversation between 
uh, a manager and another accounts executive where he was being asked to make false entries. Now, if the audit committee or anybody at a senior level came to be aware of this, then there's a lot that they could have done. So it's very important to protect the whistleblower and even before the protection is afforded, to have an excellent mechanism in place so that these questions can be raised. Someone needs to then look at whether it's a, it's a valid question or not, is it ethical or unethical, and then take on the transaction review from there. So we keep using the term red flags quite often. Uh, red flags are any suspicious transactions or any doubt doubtful transaction that a whistleblower or an employee can flag off and these are very critical to setting a series of events that could unearth large fraud. With any large fraud, nobody really knows what the final outcome is. It is these small, small things or small, small triggers that we hear of which help us to get started in building on a much larger case for an investigation. So that said, um, if you know, if you ask any of us, why won't people raise the red flag on fraud or corruption or anything unethical? Um, it might seem very heroic, but if we put ourselves in the shoes of an employee who is a silent observer to this, I think the fears and the challenges that they face will be quite obvious. Many people will hesitate to come forward and report a violation. Um, and most often the reasons are that they don't want their promotion or career prospects to suffer. Okay, so these are some of the very common statements we hear. I'm loyal to my boss and hence I will not report a violation. I do not wish to be called a title tail. Some say that these are common practices in India. What if the police get involved? And some feel, why must I bother? So these are some of the challenges that many employees face. These are other challenges or reasons why employees will not raise the red flag on any suspicious transactions. So broadly, we can categorize these as retaliation, which is the single largest reason why employees will not raise the red flag. So anyone who feels that they will suffer for having raised a doubt or communicated any doubt fears retaliation, then they will not usually communicate or raise the red flag. Breach of loyalty is another one case. So some people are very loyal to their particular team or department that they may feel that they don't have to raise that. Um, it could be seclusion. So you, what happens is in some companies, if the communication systems are not anonymous and confidential, if someone else comes to know that this employee had raised the red flag, he could be branded as someone who is you know, like a tattletale or someone who is who's trying to cause a little problems within the company. Sometimes it could also be management practices. Um, there are some areas of businesses where it is considered normal to provide bribes or gifts or, you know, incur entertainment expenses. So these could be considered management practices even if the policy says otherwise. Then there is a doubt in the mind of the employee. Must I really raise the red flag on this? Does this require any communication? Lastly, there's also an element of fear from personal liability. Any employee might fear, what if, the, what if this becomes a, a much larger investigation and the police come in, will they question me? What are my rights and liabilities? Many employees are not aware of their personal liabilities in case something crystallizes. So with all these challenges in mind, um, how do we encourage reporting within a company and how do we strengthen this whistleblower mechanism? I think one of the first steps is to define acceptable practices. Company policies must clearly explain what acceptable practices are. Usually what happens is you will have, you, you'll see many companies with a well-drafted code of conduct and ethics policy and this policy might in turn refer the reader to other policies. Most of these are drafted by lawyers 
um, and unfortunately not all of us are lawyers to be able to understand that legal jargon. So it's very important for company policies to be simple, clear, and they must explain what is acceptable. Now if we know what is acceptable, then any reader will be able to infer which are the practices that are not okay. So I'm just going to put this question, which of these lines or statements in a policy seem clear? So you have one policy which says, gifts over INR 1000 shall not be provided or accepted by employees of all levels. So as an employee, if you were to read this statement, would this seem clear? Or you see this statement, gifts of values as may be defined by management shall not be allowed. Does this seem better or is this, there's an element of ambiguity here. And we have another line which says, this and entertainment over INR 1000 shall not be allowed unless clearly approved by the management. So as an employee, if, I, if I'm witness to a transaction where a certain amount of gift expenses has been incurred, if I were to read the policy, I should be able to tell whether the practice is acceptable or not. And this is usually the starting point. If the policy itself is not clear, then an employee is not going to be able to tell whether the practice is doubtful or not. So uh, the next step is to protect the whistleblower. In companies where reporting is usually encouraged, more employees tend to come out with these complaints openly, uh, whether or not those might seem trivial. So it's a good practice to generally very vocally encourage reporting as a general practice. This can be done through emails, this can be done through general communication, uh, through any open house sessions, you can tell people, you know, so you're always open to come out and raise your questions on doubtful practices. Um, allowing anonymous reporting, at least in the initial few years, is also a good practice because many people will feel more secure or protected. If I don't have to put my name on a piece of paper, then I can raise the red flag a little bit more freely. It gives a sense of protection to me as an employee. So allowing for anonymous reporting is again another good practice. Award or laud employees who raise valid red flags. This is subject to a bit of a question or doubt in some areas, but it has worked in many companies uh, there are some organizations who still maintain confidentiality, but let's say there is an employee who, who has raised a valid red flag and the company has um, intervened and they've identified or they've thwarted a huge fraud, then that employee is sometimes given a heroic status. Or they at least take that as a case study and then showcase it to the others as this is something an individual did and this is how it helped the company. It's also important to state who will receive the complaint. Now, this is again um, a cause for concern in the minds of many employees because the compliance officer is, is sometimes, you know, it has to be someone who is approachable if it's within the company, someone who most employees can trust, or if it's very difficult to actually find one person like that, especially in the case of large companies, then another option might be to outsource the entire thing. So then an employee knows that it's going, all complaints sent will be going to an external agency and then onwards uh, the particular complaint will get classified as valid or not. So it's very important um, for the company to state who will receive the complaint and it has to be someone who in the mind of the employee, is, there shouldn't be any doubt or hesitation to escalate it too. 
It's also important to explain what would happen if an employee raises red flags, and this is important from the employee's perspective. Usually, we tend to explain this from a company's perspective by saying, you are helping us detect fraud, we are losing so much percentage on fraud, etc. But from an employee's perspective, he's seeking to protect himself. So you need to explain to him the good and the bad things. What would happen if you raise the red flag? And tell him the next steps. So now that we've received the red flag, we will then look at whether it's a valid complaint or not. If it's a valid complaint, then we will proceed with a detailed investigation. If we proceed with a detailed investigation, you may choose to call the employee for questioning. Um, all of these, it's good. I mean, even though it might seem like a difficult conversation, it's a good practice to have a lot of these communicated on a regular basis so that employees are, are aware of what happens at the next few steps once a red flag is raised. And as a fallout of that, it is very important to strengthen the investigation mechanism because once we have a red flag, in order to know which is a valid red flag which leads to a larger fraud, the investigation mechanism must be strong. Lastly, um, it's important to not publicize any false claims or invalid red flags. Um, this is usually linked with anonymous reporting. Many companies, some companies rather prefer to not use anonymous reporting because it might increase the number of false claims or invalid red flags. So in the initial years, at least till the practice or till the entire mechanism is set in place, it's, it's good to not publicize the false claims or invalid red flags. Even if you receive many false claims, you can just set it aside and look at what is valid and focus on those instead. The third step in encouraging reporting is the, the method of investigation itself. So as we discussed previously, the method of investigation must be clearly defined and communicated. So any anonymous complaint has to be segregated as valid or invalid. If it's valid, measures will be taken to investigate the complaint. If the whistleblower's participation is essential, um, you will have to communicate discreetly to that particular person and request his participation. Uh, some companies choose to publicize internally the remediation measures by maintaining confidentiality because usually what happens after an investigation is that an air of trust is lost. So in order to restore that and keep that level of trust equal throughout the medium and long term, it's also good to publicize within the company and say, uh, you know, we have these additional controls in place or these are the remediation measures we're going to consider. The entire fraud does not have to be publicized. Um, the whistleblower's participation need not be publicized, but it is good to talk about the remediation and take the case as an example. So what are the next steps to this entire thing? So, so far we've, we've seen um, how to encourage a whistleblower. So how do we get started? While this might seem a very daunting or a Herculean task, um, we just need a few very simple things to get started in order to have the whistleblower mechanism in place. Now, one of the good ways to make a start is to have an informal discussion or some something like an open house session with employees. You can have the employees come in. Um, you can talk about a little about fraud and corruption. You can understand the ground realities as to whether they faced any hesitation in raising the red flag. It's important to understand if employees have come across cases in the past uh, for which they have not raised a red flag. And if yes, it is important to understand why. Now, if you approach the whistleblower mechanism 
um, more from a ground reality perspective, um, in many cases it's proven to be more effective rather than taking the simple legal route of drafting a whistleblower mechanism just to satisfy the legal requirements. So having this kind of an open uh, discussion with employees will help the company understand what are the ground realities, what are the challenges, and what are the doubts in the minds of the employees before they come up with a red flag. Most companies have whistleblower mechanisms in place. So at the end of this open house session, it's always good to go back, reevaluate your existing policies, and make some modifications so that it suits the organization's culture in general. The person who receives the complaint, as I said, this person is also, this person or agency is also very important. So if you have an ombudsman within the company or a compliance manager, it's very important to see and assess his independence, his popularity level and respectability. Is he someone that many, comp many employees uh, will be willing to send a complaint to? If there is any element of doubt or fear, um, in sending in who the receiver is, then many people may not raise the red flag either. So if it is an agency, then that could be communicated to the employees and they will know that it's going to a third party where it will be dealt with securely. If it's somebody within the company, then it has to be someone who is independent and generally someone who is uh, a little open and accepting among the general population of the employees. So these are the first few steps that we can adopt that will help pave the way forward to encourage reporting in general. Now once these are in place, um, you can have a system of uh, a more standard system of reporting and over time you'll be able to build on the same mechanism to make it a little stronger. So that's all we have in this session. Um, any questions that you have, we can address now. Any questions related to...